Good morning. All right, glad to see you this morning. As you can see, the choir is in a different arrangement here. But that's all right. Is that all right with you? That's fine, that's fine. We're having a little technical difficulty and that thing might come on sometime or another this morning. But for you who know anything about uh, computers, it re, what is it doing? Reconfiguring it, huh? It's updating, okay. So in the meantime, and the choir has this beautiful, they are introducing you to a new call to worship this morning. And they were gonna sing it a couple times, then we're gonna put it up here, and you were gonna sing it and all of that, you know. But unless that thing comes on, you won't get to do it. So they're going to introduce it this morning. Listen to this, listen to this. The most important three minutes or five minutes in a worship service is when? When we do the call to worship. Because this sets the stage and lets us know where we're headed. You've got to listen to the words of this one. I wish we had it on the screen, but we can't do anything about that right now. It was on earlier when I was in charge up there. <laughs> but it disappeared when the, when the helpers got up there. <laughs> so, all right, listen to it. Okay, Cindy, the name of it is, as you see in your bulletin, Oh, the Glory of Your Presence. you catch? Any of you know the song? Any of you know the song? <laughs> Two of you know it. Come on up and sing it with them. <laughs> it's beautiful. I'm going to ask them to sing it one more time. Try to listen for the words, but we'll have it for you next Sunday, and you can sing it with them. Just listen to the words. It'll say everything you need for the, to hear from them. All right. this promise when you get to know it and we're close are we not okay let me welcome the this thing okay give it to us give it to us give it to us 
There it is. <laughs> All right. Just follow the choir. I may not yet be able to preach, but I want you to know something about this song before we leave here this morning. One more time, please. Can I say one thing? Yeah. I know there are some of you who like to lift your hands and praise if you're worried about other people will say something about you, but if you're one of those people, feel free to do that. Amen. Amen. second thing, Cindy, was uh, I'm going to welcome the people, but while they're still standing, while y'all are here, give us the words to uh, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers, and we'll proceed from there. And we'll proceed from there. <laughs> and we'll proceed from there. You're fine.
takes their seats, pay them a little more tower. You greet those around you and thank them for being here and being patient this morning. Thank you, and you may be seated. And welcome to church this morning. We have those who visit, and we thank you for being with us. Oh, we have somebody from Georgia, I believe, over here. What is your name there, Sister Rebecca? Not from Georgia. <laughs> You're not from Georgia. You're just here this morning. We're glad to see you back, Rebecca. And for others, we're glad to see you as well on this Father's Day. Let me remind you that Vacation Bible School is the item of the week, all week long, beginning tomorrow evening, as you notice. 5.30 dinner, 6 o'clock, the Bible School program begins. At 8 o'clock, we all come in here, and parents are invited to be here for that. And then on Friday evening, you'll notice the schedule changes slightly. We begin at 6 o'clock with the program in here, and that's for the parents as well. And then we have the dinner afterwards, and that's a covered dish for those of us who are a part of that. Keep that in mind. You see all the information there. By the way, Angie, if you want to sign up your kids or yourself, and we are having adult Bible school, as usual, uh, this coming week uh, in the fellowship hall, Angie will be back there at the conclusion of the service, and you can have this done, and you won't have to do so uh, by coming early. That's the information there. And we will rejoice with those who have reason to rejoice with birthdays over here. And none over here. Yes? Cora is here, and she just turned six. Where is Cora? She's right here. Up there. Cora, how are you? That's good. <laughs> when is the birthday? She just had it Wednesday. Oh, last Wednesday. All right. I see another hand. Paige, is that you? Yes. Um, Brandon and Garrett both had one on Tuesday. Chris had one on Friday. Okay. <laughs> Where's the Sanders reunion going to be held? <laughs> At your house, Paige? Yeah. All right. All right. Any others? Anniversaries anywhere? What did I miss in the balcony? Oh, anniversaries. Yeah. Reggie. 37 long and glorious years. Right. What is your address, Sharon? We want to send you a sympathy card. For <laughs> what? Does he know what? You didn't, do you know the date, Reggie? Friday, this Friday, 24th. There you go. Oh, yeah, All right, all right. All right, today is Father's Day, and we always recognize fathers on uh, Father's Day. It's always interesting to try to find the oldest father here. Now, some of you think you know who it is. So all fathers above 80, please stand.
All right, remain standing now. Uh, above 85, rem uh, please remain standing. Paige, you're not even a father. Why are you standing there? <laughs> All right, it's, no, who disappeared? Pete, where'd you go? Did we lose you? <laughs> uh, what is your name, sir? You're Mr. Sanders. <laughs> How old are you, Mr. Sanders? 88. 88. <laughs> uh, uh, Webster, I think you missed the meeting. We made uh, established a new church policy that the winner of the oldest father would give $10 for every uh, aid for every year he's been. And so we'll take check or cash, either one you want to do. So. All right, let's see if we have the youngest father here. Any fathers below 30, stand. Not a father here below 30? Okay, I'm a, any father here below 35, stand. Webster, are you gonna get it again? <laughs> 35, 36? No. 40. 40. Chris? How old, Chris? I am 40. Oh, you are 40. <laughs> Chris, Chris. Okay, we got to do this one. Uh, the father with the most children. I'll start with myself, four. If you have at least four children, stand, fathers. Five. <laughs> okay. How many children, Wayne? Four. Four. Who was, t Sonny Terry? Four. four. Gordon. Four. All right. I'm sorry. We are all tied. All, pardon? Okay. All fathers stand. We just want to see all the fathers here this morning. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. in recognizing a while ago, yay, pack it. I didn't recognize it. Did you remain seated? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't see you, you, but you are here, aren't you? We're glad to see Gay back. Are we not glad to see Gay back? Anybody else returning after illness or whatever? No? Glad to see you back. The uh, Gay's family and Catherine, uh, they had a death in the family this past week with the death of uh, Roselle's husband, Clifton Davis, who lived in Tappahannock. Many of, many of us knew Clifton and of course Roselle and we're glad to see them here this morning. Remember our vacation Bible school? We of course would, would invite everyone, but if, if for whatever reason you can't be here, be sure to pray for those of us who are here, and we'll have a good time together. Let's pray together. Father, it's a good day. It's Father's Day. We acknowledge that. We recognize that. We rejoice in that. We thank you for every father in this room today. And for those who may not be fathers, but have a father's heart, and reach out to children and others around them in a way that must be pleasing to you. So we pray that in these days ahead, we who are fathers will live up to the expectations that you have for us and will be the men of God you'd have us to be. Bless our church. We thank you for all the members. We thank you for Rebecca and family back visiting with us. And we thank you for your goodness and your love. We thank you for the opportunity of Vacation Bible School 
and pray that we'll be a grand time together this coming week. Thank you for the rains this past week, and we pray for those who experience damage in their homes in the Richmond area and even beyond. So we commit this time to you today, pray for our nation, for those who wear the uniform of our land and for those who wear the uniform of first responders in various ways. We thank you for them and the ministry they fulfill. Bless us now in the service that follows and we'll give you the glory and the praise for it. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. On Father's Day, we'll all stand and sing together the grand old hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Let's stand, let's sing together, please. to come up here for the prayer because uh, of uh, our hookup this morning. But I have a second reason also. Uh, I owe Junior Kent $10 for something he bought for me and I tried to give it back to him this week. He said, no, put in the offering plate. Junior Kent, I'm putting it in the offering plate this morning like I promised. <laughs> Let us pray. Dearly Father, it is indeed our privilege to be a part of this glorious day that you have provided for us. And Father, we oftentimes uh, forget and oftentimes remember those that have gone on before us. Father, we want to take this opportunity to lift up our fathers to you, those that abide with us and those that abide with you. Um, Father, those that lead by an example and those that have loved unconditionally as you have loved us unconditionally. Father, we enter now this portion of the service. We pray, Father, that you will bless this offering and multiply it and be used for the service of thy kingdom. Bless those that give, for we ask in thy name. Amen. <laughs>
be seated as the choir gets in place to sing for us again. And we're glad that you have the words, uh, not the words, but the pictures to follow this because it's a great song, Highway to Heaven. No, the wedding now, Sherry. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that I'm just a little bit excited about Bible School's music this week. So I invite anyone that's sitting out um, there in the pews to come on back with me because today we're not necessarily having youth choir practice. We are having a sneak peek to the Bible School music, so I'm really excited. So you all, come on with me, and let's get this party started. <laughs> okay, they're, are they coming? They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. All right. I think most of you are aware that this is sermon number eight in the series on uh, the family and the home. 
I don't know about you, but I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, preparing and sharing, and I hope you have found some helpful things along the way. I think it not, it's not coincidental that the final message should fall on Father's Day. It just worked out that way, but I'm glad it did. And I'm reading this morning from the book of Joshua, a familiar passage. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to skip down and read verses 14 and 15. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all of the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Skipping from there to uh, the closing verses of verse 15. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. The closing sentence is our theme part of the text. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Several years ago during the course of some reading, I came across an unusual reference to fathers, in our day at least. And the word used by the writers was the word renegade. In all honesty, I didn't pay too much attention to it until I found that it was used by an Episcopal priest in reference to fathers. And so I read on. He used it in reference to some fathers, for he said the, re the word renegade came from and was based on the word renege. And renege, he said, means to go back on a promise, an undertaking, or contract. Symptoms, uh, syn synonyms might help a little in understanding, for some of those used are default on, fail to honor, break, break out of a, a promise, and so forth. The brother was saying that some fathers deserve the renegade label for they go back on promises, default on certain obligations, and back out on some of the th promises to be the fathers they ought to be. Most of all, as fathers renege, uh, ren renege at some time or another, but for some fathers, they renege a whole lot of times and on a whole lot of things and are deserving of the renegade level and label. Having said this, I must hasten to remind you that there is another side to the word renegade, for the word has other meanings as well. I say that because the word renegade also means to rebel, to be unconventional, to march to the beat, beat of another drummer. By this standard, there are also fathers who are deserving of the renegade label. A classic example of this, and some of you may challenge me on this, a classical example of this is the well-known Indian Geronimo a renegade Apache chief who refused to abide by rules he felt were wrong for he and his people. Geronimo was a man with a backbone to take a stand for what he knew was right and to go against it for what he felt was wrong. With this definition, we should better understand what the Episcopal brother meant when he put the renegade label on fathers in our day who have the courage 
to stand for what is right and righteous, to do the unconventional, to go upstream against the rising tides, and to march to the beat of other drummers. <coughs> In this concluding message on family affairs, it is appropriate, I believe, that the emphasis is indeed on men, and especially fathers. For we have the opportunity to have a profound influence on family life in our own families and even beyond. <coughs> As a father, I am firmly convinced that God wants us to have the backbone to go upstream, to do the unconventional, to courageously face the onrushing tides that are so pre prevalent in our world today. And last but not least, to march to the beat of another drummer. I have mentioned several things already. Let me share some other specific things with you. <coughs> One of the first examples of being a renegade man or father that comes to my mind has to do with the important decisions that we are called upon, that we as fathers are called upon to make. As men and fathers, there are many decisions that come our way from time to time. Decisions that require some courage and backbone if we are to do the right thing. <coughs> Let me share one biblical example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Joshua, as you recall, was Moses' right-hand man during a very crucial time in the life of Moses and the Hebrew people. He was beside Moses when the people were delivered from Egypt after 400 years of bondage and servitude. He was with the people when they crossed the Red Sea and with them when they trudged through the wilderness. He was one of the 12 spies sent by Moses to spy out the promised land and to see what awaited them there. When they returned, you will recall, Ten of the twelve said that they needed to go back to Egypt to live in bondage, for the cities were walled in the promised land, the troops were well trained, and defeat was inevitable. Joshua, along with his sidekick Caleb, agreed with the assessment, but they said they should express on, for that's what God wanted them to do. The people listened to the majority instead of the minority. And as a result of that, they spent the next 40 years wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. Joshua was there when they finally reached the doorsteps of the promised land and prepared to enter it. When Moses died, the reins of leadership fell upon the shoulders of Joshua. And he was the man who had the responsibility and the opportunity to lead the people across the Jordan River and their conquest of the promised land. Once there, Joshua was God's chosen instrument for leading them in the conquest of the land, beginning with the walled city of Jericho and pressing on to the regions beyond. In summary, Joshua became Joshua on the spot for God. When the people faced overwhelming challenges and opportunities, but he lived up to the challenge and led them in conquest of the land promised to Abraham many, many years before. But the time came when Joshua, like all the rest of us, faced the inevitable fact that his days were numbered. Wanting to leave the people with more than a memory of victories and in battle, Joshua called the people together for some final words of family advice. He began by reminding the people that they were living in a land which they, for which they did not labor. They were inhabiting cities that they did not build. They were eating food from the gardens that they did not plant. Having made the people aware of God's blessing, he then challenged them to honor God in the days ahead by putting away the false gods of their ancestors and serving the living God of glory. He continued by reminding them that they had a choice in the matter, and he wanted them to make the right choices in the days ahead. Not wanting to leave the people in the darkness 
as to where he stood on the matter, he concluded his challenge by saying to the people, I don't know what you are going to do, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And that, my friend, is the testimony of a renegade. For Joshua dared to go upstream against the prevailing winds of his day. He and his family were going to do the God thing regardless of what anyone else did. And this, I believe, is the kind of conviction and courage that is still needed in our day, especially by fathers and other men in the family. The clarion call of God in our day is a very simple one. And that call co could be worded in this way. Renegade dads, arise and do your thing. But this is not the only thing that makes for a renegade father. In addition to having the courage to back up that which God wants us to do, Listen to this, fathers need to accept their God-given responsibility to be the spiritual leaders of their homes and their families. I base my conclusion at this point on the words of the Apostle Paul in chapters five and six of his letter to the church in ancient Ephesus. In verse 22 of chapter five, Paul was very clear in the role of the husband in the family, when he put it this way, the husband was to be the head of the wife as Christ was head of the church. A little later, he said that husbands were to love their wives, just like the, Jesus loved his church and gave his life for it. And that is not what the, and that is what the apostle was trying to get across. He was saying that the family was to honor and serve the Lord and the father was to take the lead to make sure that this happened. Fathers who fail to do so indeed are reneging on their God-given assignments. Those willing to be honest at this point would have to admit that this does not always happen in the homes of America today. In fact, it doesn't always happen in a lot of the church-related homes in America today. In most cases, the mother is the one who has to provide spiritual leadership in the family, if any spiritual values are to be expressed. The bottom line at this point may be painful, but it is true nonetheless. Fathers who renege on their God-given responsibilities at this point are indeed renegades in the bad sense of that word. If given the opportunity to state their primary responsibilities and obligations as fathers, a whole lot of men would say that providing for their families by bringing home the bacon was their number one responsibility as a father. Those who say this realize that there are other responsibility, but this in their mind is responsibility number one. While I do not belittle the breadwinner responsibility of the father, we must never let that overshadow or take away from other responsibilities that we have as fathers. For example, we as fathers need to be the breadwinners for our families, if at all possible, but we also need to be the example setters for our families as well. While we are making a living for our families, we need to realize that we must not overlook making a life as we do so. Or to put it another way, we must never get so caught up in making a living that we fail to give proper attention to making a life before all of those involved. A classical example of what I'm talking about was recently, in fact, it's in the news right now illustrated by a highly publicized trial in which a teenage boy was on trial for killing another person who was in the car with him when he was driving while drunk. The son of a wealthy family, the parents got a high-priced lawyer to defend their son. You know what happened? 
the lawyer got the boy off because he said the boy was a victim. And he created a word for us at this point. He said the boy was a victim of affluency. In other words, the parents of the boy were so affluent, which means not just rich, but filthy rich. So they were never, so the boy never knew right from wrong. Now, I, this, this is a confession. I was an English major in college. I know you would never know that. But I had never heard the word affluency until this trial hit the press and the newspapers. Now, I know what it means. I still think the lawyer's defense and the judge's decision were the biggest miscarriage of justice I've ever heard about in a long time. Simply put, father and mother were so busy making a living for their super affluent son, they failed to make a life for him. Renegade fathers realize there's more to life than making a living. All of which brings us to yet another characteristic of renegade fathers. In addition to the things already mentioned, renegade fathers accept the challenge of what I choose to call the drummer challenge. And I will try to illustrate the meaning of that as well. As you realize, Ours is a day when adults as well as youth are caught up in what I choose to call herd mentality. And herd mentality simply means that they go along with the crowd or the herd because everyone else is going that way or doing their thing. Many young people, for example, begin to smoke, drink, do drugs, and a lot of other things because everybody else is doing it. It doesn't seem to matter if that they were, what they were doing was right or wrong. They joined the crowd because everyone else in the crowd is doing these things. If you challenge my conclusion, just check out the way that young people dress in our day. You would think, would you not, that young men and young women would outgrow the herd mentality at some point. But alas, that is not the way it happens. Instead of going upstream by marching to the beat of another drummer, many keep right on following the way of the crowd and in doing so, neglect their wives and their children along with a lot of other things. In our scripture for the day, Joshua provides us with another answer to the herd mentality. After challenging the people to do the godlike thing in their continued conquest of the promised land, he said to them, I really want you to do this, and God wants you to do this, but whether you will or won't, I do not know. But of one thing I surely want you to be aware, as far as me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord by taking the stand that he took. Then Joshua proved to be another Geronimo because he was willing to go against the crowd no matter what anyone else did. That made him a renegade in the best sense of that word. I began this message by telling you about the Episcopal priest who used the word renegade in reference to some men in our day who renege on their God-given responsibilities. But he went on to remind us that there is a positive side to the renegade label, for the word renegade or re rebel also describes those who rebel to do the unconventional or to march to the beat of another drummer. This, I believe, is the kind of renegades we need in our day if we expect to turn the tide in the right way. To accomplish this, will require many things. The first being fathers who are willing to take a stand in fatherly leadership, as did Joshua, that he didn't know what anyone else was going to do in his day, but as for him and his house, his family, they were going to serve the Lord. We need dads with that kind of commitment if we are going to be the dads that we ought to be. In the second place, it is for fathers, the challenge is for fathers and men 
who will accept the biblical challenge to be the spiritual leaders in their families and homes in order that their families may be honoring to the Lord. Fathers and dads who refuse to accept this challenge are failing to live up to their God-given respons responsibilities as the spiritual leaders of their families. A third challenge that we talked about was that renegade fathers need to realize that there is a world of difference between making a living and making a life. Just about anyone can make a living in one way or another, but it takes a man with godly values who will strive in all that he does to make a life for those who look up to him. Of the tragedies of the days, one of the tragedies of the days is that some fathers will leave their children a heap of money or things while failing to leave them the example of a father with godly values. The fourth item on our renegade challenge was perhaps one of the most important of all. I say that because renegade dads are those who refuse to get caught up in the herd mentality of our day and decide rather to march to the beat of another drummer and God is the one that's playing the drum. As dads, every one of us here on this Father's Day needs to ask an all-important question. And the question is this, have I gotten so caught up in the herd mentality of my day that I do not have the courage or the faith that is needed to march to the beat of that other drummer? I close with a simple truth from Henry David Thoreau, who was a popular author in the mid-19th century. One of his most famous writings was Walden, in which we find the words referred to several times in my message today. And I quote Thoreau, if one does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. One of the greatest needs of our day is for men, dads, granddads, anybody in between, who are willing to heed the challenge of Thoreau and march to the beat of another drummer. And we need to do so because God is beating that drum. My challenge to every dad and to every man here today is that we accept God's challenge to march to the beat of another drummer. And I close with that simple picture that shows you what the other drummer really looks like. He is not caught up in following the crowd. Amen. Father, we thank you for this Father's Day. I thank you for every father, for every man here today. Fathers, grandfathers, those who seek to be the spiritual leaders in their families and to serve you. I praise you for this and I love you for this. And if there's a father today who recognizes that he may not be uh, meeting the challenge at this point, help him to have the strength or the courage of another Geronimo and step out from the herd and to be what you would have him to be. We commit the hour to you and the day to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to continue as we stand and sing the hymn which sums up everything I've been talking about. Joshua said, I don't know what you folks are going to do, but I know what my family and I are going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. It's an invitational hymn, a commitment hymn. If a father here or any man here or anyone else here would simply like to say, Pastor, I, I haven't lived up to the challenge, but I'm making a new commitment here. That whatever you want to do, whatever the Lord leads, we stand and we sing it together, please.
thank you again for your presence on this Father's Day, for all of our fathers, and for everyone else who is here. It's your day, may it be a great day. Let me remind you again that Bible school gets underway tomorrow afternoon, and Angie is back in the fellowship hall right now for anyone who wants to register in advance, their kids or themselves. And I remind you again that we will have an adult class. Leslie Sanders and Ronnie Hall and yours truly will be teaching that, not all at one time, but we'll take time. Turn. We invite you to be a part of it. Let us bow in prayer as we are dismissed. Father, we count it a privilege to be here today. Our hearts have been warmed. Your spirit has been present. You allowed the uh, projection to come on so that we could follow things there. And so it's all worked out for good. We praise you for it, and we love you for it, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.